Good afternoon. My name's Todd Eby. I'm the manager of project review here at the commission. Um, all participants are muted and we ask that you disable your camera when you join. The chat box is available for questions that you can enter at any time. Questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Uh, additionally, this session is being recorded. So we have uh, three presenters today. The first will be Mike Appleby, the, man the supervisor of groundwater, Bill Miller, hydrogeologist in the project review program, and Dave Hackler, environmental scientist in the project review program. I'd like to introduce and hand, hand it over to Mike Appleby at this point. Thanks, Todd, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Appleby. I am the groundwater supervisor here at the commission. Uh, we have a lot to go over today, so I'm just going to jump right into things. Today, we are going to be talking about uh, part two of the webinar series. This is about evaluating sustainability and impacts to the environment. Uh, the next part of the webinar series will be about uh, the commission developed voluntary action plans and, as well as uh, utilizing the new AHE form. So that'll also be worth uh, tuning in for. So what you can expect today is a presentation by Bill Miller uh, regarding sustainability. Uh, sustainability is probably the most important of the risk factors to uh, projects because it is talking about the sustainability or the ability of that source to produce uh, the requested quantity. So obviously this is very important to uh, people's operations. This is also the risk factor that is most likely to have a significant amount of uh, information and data already available, whether it's through a historical aqua test or through historical withdrawal and hopefully water level data. So most projects should have a start on this uh, risk factor. And Bill's going to talk about how to utilize some of that data that you are hopefully already have in developing the AHE process. Uh, then Dave is going to talk about impacts to the environment. Uh, in contrast to the sustainability risk factor, this one is least likely to have any uh, previously developed information because historical aquifer tests often uh, neglected to address uh, impacts to surface waters uh, as well as impacts to general environment or rare, threatened, or endangered species. Because of all that, uh, there, there may be additional uh, information that needs to be collected, so you should start this evaluation early in the process uh, as you're starting the, the review of the AG information. Uh, and Dave's going to go over the screening process that you can use um, as you're evaluating impacts of the environment. So this is very important to get started on early because often it takes a lot of uh, time to work through to adequately resolve with other agencies and also to supplement any existing data that you may have. Uh, we do have a little bit of a bonus feature for you uh, later on today. Dave's going to hit on that. So stay tuned for that. And it's a certificate of attendance. Uh, that's in response to some of the comments that we've received from prior webinars and from certainly from the last one. And then finally, we've got uh, questions for about 15 minutes or so. But if we have questions that take longer than 15 minutes, uh, we'll certainly stick around to answer all of those. And as Todd mentioned, please utilize the chat feature for that. Hopefully, you know by now that this is about the AG policy. Uh, if you haven't looked at it, it's available on a website, so I'd encourage you to do so. A brief discussion about what we have talked about in the past. Uh, the last webinar uh, was a, provided an overview of the AG as well as uh, initiation into the first risk factor, which was impacts to other users. Uh, the AHE, as we said last time, is intended to focus on what matters. Uh, in other words, we want you collecting and analyzing data to a level that is commensurate with the risk associated with a project. Uh, we also want you to utilize to the maximum extent possible any existing data. So the AHE process is a guide for compiling uh, that data as well as putting into uh, the compartmentalized risk factors that we've developed. Bill's going to talk a good bit about, uh, or at least a little bit about the uh, site conceptual model. Uh, this is uh, very important as you work through these risk factors because it is an overlying concept that should help guide you through uh, development and completion of each of these risk factors. So 
the site conceptual model is something that is very important and should be continued to be reevaluated as you collect and analyze additional data. It's important to not to develop your site conceptual model and then set it aside. It is something that needs uh, further refinement as you learn more about your project. Another important aspect of the AHE process is that it is a screening tool uh, that should be utilized to uh, start at high levels and work your way down through as you're focusing on the pieces of a project that matters. It's also about documenting those results. So at the end of all of this, you're going to end up with a, a form submittal to us that hopefully is going to convince us the same thing that you're convinced of and that all of the risk factors have been adequately addressed or screened out. It also is very important to realize that through this AHE process, you may realize that you are not able to screen some of these factors out and that some additional data collection is necessary. But we're also encouraging through this process that it is a targeted data collection. It is not like an offer testing plan where you are doing a review of everything. You should be able to screen some of those things out and that should help to minimize or reduce the costs of the renewal process. So this is something that is uh, to be completed only when 80612 has not previously been met. So with this, I'm gonna hand it over to Bill Miller to talk about sustainability. How about? Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Bill Miller. Uh, as Todd mentioned, I'm uh, I'm one of the nameless, faceless commission staff that act, that reviews these submittals as they as they come in um, in the uh, project review groundwater section. Uh, we're going to talk a, a little bit about a, a brief uh, discussion of sustainability and how that's addressed through the uh, through the AHE process. Um, what you see on your screen now is an is actually from the policy uh, and it provides a, a, an actual definition of what we mean when we say sustainability. Uh, and it's really the ability of a source to reliably deliver a specific quantity of water. Um, when a, when a, a, a source is approved for a certain amount, we want to ensure that 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 amount is, is a reliable and uh, it, it, and will be there during uh, all periods, even through uh, drier or drought periods. Uh, that definition goes on to say that the definition of sustainability does not consider other impacts to uh, to other users or to the environment. Um, that's true, uh, and we are going to discuss those. We already discussed impacts to other users. We already discussed, or we will be discussing impacts to the environment. But it's important to remember that all of these these risk factors tie back into that conceptual model, the understanding of how groundwater is moving in the subsurface, what's going on, you know, what's available. Uh, so they are interrelated. So how do we evaluate sustainability? We assess the ability of the source to reliably produce the requested quantity through a one in 10 year recurrence drought without causing unacceptable lowering of the water level in the source or in the aquifer. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, so we're gonna go, like Mike said, you know, this is of the three things we look at, this is the one where you're probably gonna have some data. Uh, we're gonna go through what you might have and how you can use it uh, through the AHE screening process to, uh, to either assess the sustainability or identify those data gaps or those areas where you may need a little bit of extra data. So the whole purpose of the uh, the approval is, is to limit the withdrawals so, so that the sustainability of the resource is not exceeded. Um, we want, like I said, we want to make sure that the uh, that what has been approved is reliable and will be there. Uh, this helps assist a, a project sponsor or a system be better informed as to what their what their capacities really are. Uh, it does no good to uh, approve a well for a half million gallons a day when it can only make that that amount 
during the spring or when water levels are up. And during the fall or the, the summer, uh, that water is just not there. It, it doesn't help uh, in planning, doesn't help in, in, uh, in assessing what, uh, what the system's uh, capacity is, actually is. That being said, if there are some risk factors, if there are some source vulnerabilities, um, and other uh, sources of water are available, uh, assist, a, a source can be approved for a higher amount than what we think is sustainable over the course of the entire year. Um, typically with some kind of restriction, water level uh, cutoff or, or, or something of that nature to account for those periods uh, when it's not, when all the water is not available. But that needs to be known going in. That that's not something that uh, that we want to find out, or you want to find out, two years down the road after you've gotten your approval. What do we look at when we're trying to assess sustainability? Uh, we're looking at at a number of things. Uh, we're looking at uh, what's the uh, the capability to reliably produce the requested thirty day average. Um, over a 90 day period without recharge. And when we talk about 90 day period, we're gonna talk about, you're gonna hear that a lot. Uh, what we look at is a 90 day projection of drawdown uh, in, the, uh, in the source well, to ensure that that, that level is, is not going to hit some kind of limiting factor, uh, the top of the screen or a, a significant water bearing zone, uh, something of that nature. We're also gonna look at the ability of the source to provide a maximum instantaneous withdrawal rate. And we're gonna talk about this in just a minute. Those numbers can be a little bit different, the 30 day average and the maximum instantaneous withdrawal rate. We're gonna look at the estimated groundwater recharge during a one in 10 year drought. How much water is actually available uh, within, the, uh, within the contributing area to, uh, to be withdrawn at the well. Uh, one of the things we're gonna look at as we're going through the AHE sustainability is we, we wanna make sure there's, that the potential for loss of aqua storage uh, as a result of pumping is not present. You know, we don't want to see groundwater mining where where groundwater is being removed at a higher rate than it's being uh, being recharged. One of the ways we can do this is is the observed lowering of the water level in the aquifer over time. And like I said, we want to make sure that um, that withdrawals at the well are not going to expose uh, water bearing zones, the top of the screens, the pump intake, other critical levels which can lead to the loss of aqua storage, damage to the aquifer, uh, compaction, biofouling, you know, you expose uh, material that's, that's normally saturated to air and, and all kinds of bad things can happen. Going back to the, uh, the 30 day average versus the maximum instantaneous rate. Uh, 30 day average, you still see uh, some middles that, uh, that just, don't seem to get the 30-day the average concept. I've got a little picture of an Excel sheet up there with, um, you can see the top uh, red box is around the formula. It's a pretty simple formula. It's generating, you know, it's generating the numbers shown in the lower red box that the 172,721,000 gallons in that day, the 30-day average is the average of that number in the 29 days preceding it. And it's, Simply that. Uh, let's say this source has a uh, an approval, 30 day average approval of 200,000 a day uh, and a maximum instantaneous rate of 200 gallons a minute. You know, the 200,000 gallons per day on a 30 day average, if you do the division by 1440, and I didn't write it down on top of my head, but it's, you know, it's, it's less than 200 gallons a minute. Um, 200 gallons a minute would, would yield 288,000 a day. So you can see in, in the box in green, we actually have a day where we exceeded the 200 gallon per minute or 200 gallon per day threshold for the 30 day average. We didn't exceed the 200 gallon per minute maximum instantaneous withdrawal rate, however, and that's okay because we're gonna average that one high day over the, that 30 day period. And as long as those withdrawals above the 30 day average are offset by withdrawals below the 30 day average, your 30 day average is gonna stay within the, uh, within the limit. So 
what are we looking at? We're looking at uh, sustainability and typically we will not recommend or we won't recommend approval of a project at a rate that exceeds historically tested rates. Uh, we wanna see a demonstration that that, that well uh, can supply uh, the requested rate. We're gonna look at the 30 day average withdrawals uh, during drought or dry periods. Like I mentioned, we, we try to use a one in 10 year uh, drought period as our standard. So we're, we're interested in how those wells behave during those, those times. Uh, when we look at the groundwater availability analysis, we're not gonna approve a well uh, that shows that more than 100% of the available uh, recharge is going to be withdrawn. Uh, again, but then we get into a groundwater mining situation. And again, we're not gonna, uh, if the withdrawal is expected to cause unacceptable lowering in the water well or the aquifer, uh, that's going to be something that uh, is going to preclude uh, approval of that project. So how does this dovetail in with the, the AHE, the risk-based approach? We're going to look at three, four things, uh, three things in particular. Uh, the groundwater availability, availability, how much water is available, the historical testing that's that's been done, uh, the operational, and that says testing and it should say data, historical operational data, and then try to identify as we go through the screening process, are there data gaps and where are they? So how much water is available? Uh, we, we look at this through a groundwater availability analysis. Any of you that have done uh, aquifer test plans or, or submitted applications in the past should be familiar with the, uh, with the process. Um, we're gonna define the contributing area of, uh, of groundwater you know, what's the area we're looking at. We're going to determine a recharge rate that tells us how much water is, is being recharged per unit area. We're gonna look at what water is already being used and then determine if the requested withdrawal is within that 100% um, or, you know, can be supplied by the available recharge. It's important to understand that this is a screening activity. This is primarily a desktop activity, at least initially. Um, the goal is to identify any potential uh, issues that, that may need attention. So let's talk about uh, delineate, delineating a groundwater contributing area. And, and this really goes to, Mike mentioned the, uh, the site conceptual model and this, and you're gonna hear me talk about uh, that throughout the, uh, the presentation today because it does impact all aspects. Uh, and it's something that should be dynamic. Uh, you may go into a project and have some fairly firm ideas about how things are gonna behave. What's, what are we gonna find? Um, and that's fine, um, but you, that has to be adjusted based on the data that you collect, the evaluations that you do. Uh, the, the, what we don't wanna see or what you don't wanna do is, and it's tempting, is try to make the data fit the conceptual model. Make the conceptual model fit the data. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that uh, in some other aspects here. And then the other thing we wanna look at is, is remember the AHE is a, is a screening uh, process. As we're looking at trying to quantify the potential impacts for sustainability or for uh, potential impacts of the environment, we'd like to develop multiple lines of evidence. Um, the more evidence and the more evaluation you can find that, that point towards or help quantify that risk is, uh, is appropriate and, and useful in this process. So we're gonna delineate the area that comprises the groundwater basin. Now this is, it's a general term used to uh, describe the groundwater flow system that has defined boundaries. Um, yeah, I, I've seen, had arguments or discussions, I should say, uh, that well, well, next to the river in Harrisburg should get credit for the entire watershed above that well. Um, that's really not manageable. Um, yeah, you could you could make the argument that oh, I can look at a molecule of water that falls in upstate New York or up up in Cooperstown, and eventually it's going to flow past this well. Uh, but it's not really part of the groundwater flow system adjacent to that well, and that's really what we're trying to. Uh, trying to estimate.
also want to make a point um, on that. That uh, again, going to the, the idea of make the, uh, the evaluation fit the data, not the other way around. Um, we still see on occasion uh, an estimation. Well, we're going to pull X amount of water. Per minute out of this well, and based on an assumed porosity and some other factors. That equates to 647 acres. So our contributing area is 647 acres. And here's what we think it looks like. Um, that's a useful check whenever you're, when you're trying to evaluate your area of influence. It really doesn't have a place when you're trying to delineate a ground, a groundwater contributing basin. So the delineation typically starts with a watershed delineation. Unfortunately, a lot of them end there too. Uh, it needs to be refined to accommodate that 90 day projected area of influence. And there's that 90 day figure again. You want to you project your drawdowns uh, based on historical testing out 90 days without their recharge and use that area of influence as a guide in uh, determining your, your uh, contributing area. This is going to be similar, but not identical to a source water protection area delineation. The, those systems or those those wells that, that may have a source water protection program, uh, those areas are usually bounded by a time of travel calculation. Uh, in this case, we want to look at the entire basin. And then this is a, another topic that I'm going to bring up a, a number of times. The application asks for a map of the, of the uh, delineated groundwater contributing basin. You also need to include some narrative as to how you determine that. What were the assumptions? What limitations um, went into that determination? Uh, we'll talk about this throughout, but but basically, you want to submit enough information that it, any professional reading that report would draw the same conclusions or at least similar conclusions to uh, to what you're making. And this is an also a good point, to, a good spot to point out that, uh, as Mike said, you want to start early. Um, you may go through uh, your whole process and, and realize that one of the limiting factors, one of the unknowns is what is that contributing area? If that's known with enough uh, lead time, you may be able to do some some groundwater elevation monitoring and, and construct some, some fairly accurate groundwater contour maps that are going to uh, to give you some guidance on what that contributing area looks like. And again, this is this is the first of, of my don't do this slides. Um, that that map on the side is is a something that was submitted as a contributing area. The the blue is the uh, estimated area of influence. Um, your Estimated area of influence should probably be contained within your contributing area, with the exception of maybe some down gradient uh, area beyond this diagonalization point. Uh, th this map it doesn't even show the up gradient extent of the uh, contributing area in red. It goes off the map. We don't know how big that is, and it doesn't. It only contains about half of the uh, the area of influence. So. Take some care uh, when draw, when doing your your uh, contributing area delineation. Uh, make sure that that it makes sense geologically. Uh, that previous slide. The other thing you want to make sure of um, geology matters. Uh, if you're looking at a watershed and there's a diabase dike that cuts halfway through, uh, What's on the other side of that dike may not be av available and, and probably should be dropped from the uh, contributing area. So once we have the uh, the area, the contributing area, we wanted to look at well, what, how much water is that going to collect? Uh, you, you should evaluate multiple sources, references. Uh, with that, though, don't use an average rate. Uh, Look at all the uh, the sources, the uh, the rates that are provided, and choose one that you think is is best uh, representative of what the actual recharge is, and then provide those sources and provide your rationale for picking the uh, the number that you did. And then remember, we're we're looking at a one in ten year drought recharge. The the typical uh, 
number that we use is 60% of the one in two year. Um, if you actually find a one in 10 year number, um, that's, 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 that's great. Uh, just make sure that it, it fits with the uh, conceptual model um, that you're looking at and that it, that it is accurate. So summary on the groundwater availability analysis. Uh, we're, we're looking at a delineation of a groundwater contributing basin. We're looking at what water can be collected within that. Uh, we're looking at a one in, one in 10 year drought recharge, uh, provide sources, provide the support for, for what you've determined. Um, and if there are data gaps or if there are anything, you know, you get, you do the groundwater availability analysis, like I said, it's a screening. And you get to the end of it and you're at 15%. You know, your, your withdrawal is 15% of the available drawdown. That's pretty good, pretty good indication that groundwater availability is not an issue. You do the process and you come up to, and you get 98%, uh, you might want to, uh, to take a look at that, that the, uh, at, at the, the contributing base and delineation, make sure that uh, it's appropriate and correct and, and you know, this is something that, that may point to some additional data collection to, uh, to verify that, that there is water available for the requested withdrawal. Okay, let's talk about historical testing. We determined or at least evaluated how much water is available. Some of the common problems you see in historical testing um, they're typically single well tests. They, they don't have monitoring wells, or if they do have a, a monitoring well, it's maybe a well or two. Uh, the well may not be in its final form. Uh, and that's a caveat that, that it also, you know, when you're in a carbonate setting or a sand and gravel well, the well may be in its final form, but it may not have been developed uh, sufficiently. So the testing data, uh, may be a little bit different than, than the operational data, and that's something you need to, to keep in mind as you're looking through this. Again, you might have none or very limited monitoring network, uh, primarily as it relates to what we're gonna talk about next, the potential impacts to the environment could also impact the assessment or the evaluation of the potential impact of the groundwater users. Uh, some of these historical tests are of limited duration. 48 hours is common. Um, some of them are 24 hours or, or, or less. It, it just depends. Uh, the, the typical, st the standard now is, is 72 hours. And the other thing we find is a lot of times there's very limited recovery data. Uh, recovery data can be instrumental in de demonstrating that, you know, there is no recharge, or excess recharge during the test, that the aquifer is not of limited aerial extent. Uh, some of those things that you can look at and assess using a T over T uh, prime plot are difficult to do so when you have three data points for recovery. So why is historical testing useful? You know, why, do we, uh, why do we wanna look at that? Um, it provides a, a baseline a snapshot of, of what the, the well characteristics were, what the octave characteristics were uh, in the past uh, when the well was drilled or shortly thereafter. And by comparing some of the operational data that we were going to collect after that uh, can be used to, to verify that, that the, the characteristics, the, the conclusions that were made uh, based on that initial testing are, are indeed supported. Um, so uh, again, it provides some line of evidence. Um, And, and I can't stress this enough. This is an evaluation. What we're asking for is an evaluation of historical testing, its appropriateness, its conclusions, how they, they, they move forward with the, with the data we've collected. Don't simply attach an historical report to the form and say, okay, you've got your historical testing, we're, we're good. We, there should be some evaluation attached with that. Again, we're gonna evaluate 90 day projected drawdown. We're gonna look at the estimated area of influence. Um, we're gonna evaluate the recharge data or the recovery data, I'm sorry, if it's, uh, if it's available. Uh, and then provide those evaluations and conclusions in the, uh, 
in the uh, submittal. So we're going to look at now. We're going to look at historical operational data. Um, has the well been operated at the requested rate? Uh, has it been operated during a drop period? Uh, withdrawal data is good, but water level data is really needed to evaluate sustainability. Uh, look at what's the time period of the data. Uh, a lot of times we'll see. Well, here's our here's our data for the last two years uh, for a, a well that's coming in with uh, a 15 or 25 year. Uh, cycle between the between approvals. Um, and I want to point out that historical operational data can be more important than the testing data. Uh, part of the, the limitations of an aquifer test is you're trying to project the behavior of that well over a 15 year period based on three days worth of pumping that can be uh, that can be challenging. And what you submit should tell a picture. Uh, this is this is a plot we recently got in and and they showed us, you know, what the behavior was during some significant drought, drought periods. But there's nothing to compare it to. Uh, don't know what the well does when there's no drought period. Uh, you know, this is, and I don't think it, it came with a lot of uh, explanation or evaluation. Um, so make sure you tell the picture and, and use use plots and visuals to uh, to help support the evaluation narrative that you supply. And that evaluation is going to be on the order of uh, does the operation data agree with historical testing data? Uh, does it show any long term trends? Uh, does it support the conceptual model or does the conceptual model need to be uh, be revised? And the other thing is, are there significant season, seasonal variations? And this is one uh, came in for. Uh, for renewal. Um, and you can see there's a, a definite long term trend and this this goes to the point of look at the entire uh, period of, of, of data. If you had just submitted the last 3 years on this, it would look, you know, it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty stable. Uh, but when you look at the data collection collected over a uh, 15 year time period, it's obvious that there's some, there's some. Groundwater mining going on here that groundwater. Uh, static elevations have been dropping through time as a result of the withdrawals at this well. And finally, provide data and evaluation. Uh, what you see on the uh, right of this this plot was was something that was submitted recently. Uh, you know, we asked for historic historical operational data. We got this. We got three years worth of. of Withdrawals and water level, uh, no plot, no discussion, no evaluation. Um, that's that's not enough for us to uh, to make a, a good review. Um, so, what are the assumptions, limitations of the data that you have? Uh, and again, show your work. Any professional reviewing the AHE should come to the same conclusion. So, at this point, we're going to move on to the uh, third question: evaluation, potential assessing potential impacts of the environment. Um, Dave's going to present some information regarding screening tools to identify potential sensitive features. And then I'm going to come back on and, and talk about uh, the evaluation of those uh, as part of the AHE process. But uh, first, uh, Dave has an announcement. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is Dave Hackler with the Susquehanna River Basin Commission. I'm an environmental scientist. Um, my day to day, I typically review all water withdrawal projects um, for their environmental screening process. Uh, so I look for environmental resources and associate coordination uh, with partner agencies and we make decisions on our approvals. Uh, but first, I'm going to present your equivalent of a commercial break in our webinar. Um, last webinar, we actually had received, as Mike indicated, um, a request for a potential certificate, which validates your attendance. Um, so we decided to incorporate that into our webinar series. Now, unfortunately, we can't provide you with a certificate for part one, uh, but moving forward for this webinar series and others that we're offering, uh, this will be something we provide uh, as long as you attend and you can complete the steps that we have outlined. Um, this slide will be attached at the end of the presentation. So I ask that you follow these steps um, at that time and, um, Please join me as I talk about environmental resource screening. So this right now is presented as the third risk factor and 
in all reality, it's actually one of the three risk factors that should be performed very early in the process. Um, because what you're going to find is a lot of these resources um, require agency coordination, and that is something that can take a long time. So for the steps of assessing impacts to the environment, there are essentially four steps in that process. I'm going to be talking about the identification of environmental resources, so the screening process, what you should identify near your project that may be an, a concern or assess for impacts. Um, Bill is going to talk about the evaluation of those potential impacts um, as you screen them out or, or potentially can't define the risk. Uh, you're going to have to determine if monitoring is necessary. Um, and then I'll uh, chime in at the end to just discuss the resolution of those potential impacts, uh, what we're looking for as you complete the AHE process. So the first step is actually a desktop approach. Um, this is your environmental resource screening. Now, since those wells were drilled decades ago, um, environmental resource databases have become, um, you know, very uh, complete, uh, very easy to use. Um, and it's actually a very big benefit to project sponsors and consultants looking to identify environmental resources within a project area. Um, so the process I'm going to outline is actually what we perform uh, as we review your AHE and what if, if you can complete these steps, um, hopefully then we'll be in sync as we review and you won't have any issues as we approve the AHE. So um, the first step is the uh, screening radius or distance, um, what we do, and as we've discussed with the other users in sustainability, um, your radius to screen these resources should be your 90 day um, AOI. Um, in the example provided, um, you'll see there are two wells and based on their pumping rates and setting, uh, their AOIs differ slightly. Um, and these are what we're going to be reviewing as we um, identify resources. Um, um, so then, um, what this does is it, it's going to identify delineated resources. So you're going to be identifying resources that have already been assessed um, by partner agencies um, from which then you can assess potential impact. Um, a big part of this screening process is you want to also utilize aerial satellite imagery. So yes, you're delineating or identifying the delineated resources um, but you're also going to be confirming their presence or absence with the understanding that some of these resources that have been delineated decades ago and their location uh, or their size may have changed based on recent satellite imagery. Uh, so that's really important. So um, as far as where are these resources located, how you can access these resources, um, so the commission obviously has multiple member states uh, within our basin and environmental resources are regulated um, slightly differently and the resources provide differ from agency to agency. Uh, so what the commission has done is within our applica online applications, uh, the AHE uh, application um, includes this as well, along with surface water, groundwater withdrawal applications. It's an environmental resource information for applications page. Um, and on there is uh, their links, which will allow you to access databases from which you can identify resources uh, within your area of influence for your sources. So highly encourage the use of this. Um, these links are what commission staff uses to assess your project as well. Um, they're recognized, published by um, partner resource agencies. Um, and it's a very good, quick um, reference to get to these uh, settings. Um, navigating this uh, resource page can, you know, anywhere from minutes to a few hours, you'll be able to identify all resources uh, within your estimated AOI. If you do that early, then you'll be able to get this process started um, fairly quickly. So I'd like to first start off with rare, threatened, and endangered species inventory. Now, this is something, if you have done the waiver in the past, as we've moved to the AHG now, um, it wasn't a requirement of our online application. However, um, this is a very important environmental resource to uh, screen out um, from the start. So 
Rare threat and endangered species uh, were often not considered uh, decades ago when these wells were drilled. However, now uh, their polygons for where they're located um, are fairly extensive and um, um, they're really their um, detection early on in the process is going to help um, influence um, what other resources are going to be needed to be screened. So um, it's very important that you complete this process. Um, each state is a little bit different. Uh, we have links to those within the online um, applications. And part of this process is when you complete your RT species um, inventory, it is typically going to determine if there are RT species within the uh, search area. Uh, this is typically a half mile radius search from your well. Um, and from there, if there's detection, there could be agency coordination that is necessary. So this is kind of a two part process. Uh, you complete the RT species inventory. And from there, if there's a detection, it's going to trigger a coordination aspect. Now, this coordination aspect is really important because it will, one, allow you to identify the species that are potentially located there. And then, two, it gives you a jump start to detect the potential um, impacts that may result from your well. So, very vital you get this done really early on in your process. Um, while you're assessing and identifying the species that may be present, it's really important to identify if they rely on water resources. Um, if so, you're going to want to take a closer look at wetlands and streams associated. Uh, the next resources, um, streams, rivers, springs, and ponds. Um, so first, you're going to want to look at the location relative to the AOI. So what streams, ponds, or rivers are delineated within that AOI. From there, it's really important that the next step is you're gonna look at those drainage areas. Um, assess, are there any headwaters located within the AOI? These could be, these are considered sensitive. They also, if encountered for a recharge boundary, um, you could potentially dewater, have significant impact. Um, so you're gonna to wanna to delineate all of them uh, from headwaters all the way up to larger systems. Um, you want to delineate the hydrology. So, um, is this an intermittent stream, perennial, um, or is it ephemeral um, in the setting? That's going to help you decide later on if there's an impact that could potentially occur. Uh, water quality designation. So, um, this isn't if it's a creek or a creek. This is going to be those delineations that have um, been assessed and applied by state agencies. Um, which could warrant extra protection. So not all designations are the same. All streams are all, in, uh, they're all important and we, we want to avoid impact. Some have special protection designations, whether that be um, EV or HQ in Pennsylvania, um, class A, B, C, A, B, or C uh, with a standard um, of trout or trout stocked TS in New York, or in Maryland, it could be tier two. Uh, you want to know that ahead of time because those are the resources that may um, need potential agency coordination. Uh, the presence of wild trout and RTE species as well in these streams. Um, wild trout are protected, they're recreational, are a source of recreation, um, and RTE species such as the hellbender. So if streams possess those resources, they need to be screened out as a potential for impact as they could be considered sensitive as well. Um, as far as wetlands, um, we typically utilize the National Wetlands Inventory. This is a great starting point. Um, again, you're going to be screening wetlands to your AOI. Um, you're going to be looking at the uh, location relative to the AOI. Are they located far away? Are they located near your source? Uh, you want to look at the hydrology of these sources. Um, the NWI is great because they give you an initial starting point with the hydrology modifier. You could look to see if it's a seasonal. Um, seasonal hydrology, if it's perennial, um, if it if it's going to uh, be a deep water habitat, such as a stream or a pond, um, these are all um, classifications that will help you as you assess the potential for impact. Um, wetlands are typically a habitat or offer habitat for RT species, such as the bog turtle. Um, so you definitely want to do the RT species search first. If it's determined that a species such as the bog turtle or a species that utilizes wetlands as part of its life cycle is present, then you're going to want to make sure 
um, you assess this potential um, feature for impacts. Um, another thing you could do is look at previous delineations. The commission doesn't require delineations as part of, as part of your online application. Um, however, uh, a lot of times with municipalities or development nearby your well source, uh, there may be a delineation present, which you can utilize. Um, and wetlands, depending on their um, special protection designations, whether it be New York, um, you know, class one through four, um, or PA with their exceptional value wetlands, uh, or Maryland with their tier two. Um, if you identify one of these features within your estimated AOI, it's highly encouraged that um, you reach out to the respective uh, agency overseeing its jurisdiction for um, clearance of potential impacts. Following a desktop review of resources within your estimated AOI, um, it's highly recommended that you, um, you show up on site for a site visit. Um, Usually this is conducted by the project sponsor and their consultants or their consultants on behalf of their project sponsors. Um, what you want to do is you want to verify those desktop resources that were mapped and identified online um, do exist within your uh, project area. Uh, you can check to see if um, the hydrology matches uh, what was mapped online. Um, you can check to see if they still exist. Um, NWI sometimes they were map decades ago, uh, the form of that wetland may have changed. Um, and site visits could be um, a result of agency coordination um, as part of that RT species. When you submit project um, specific information, um, they could request to go on site, do a survey to see if there's available habitat. So that's another aspect of the site visit. Um, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Bill where he's gonna talk about the uh, potential uh, for impact. Okay, uh, thanks, Dave. Um, like, like Dave said, the, the first thing is to identify what features are present within the 90 day area of influence of the well and evaluate if potential impacts are likely. Uh, like Mike said at the onset of this, uh, of this uh, webinar, this is the one of the three that, that you typically find data gaps. Uh, generally historical data, historical testing, uh, does not address potential impacts to the environment, uh, be it streams, wetlands, or, or other uh, sensitive features. But they can be evaluated in the AHE, AHE process. Um, they could be evaluated and, and screened out, um, or more likely they can, can guide some targeted uh, additional testing data collection that can uh, resolve some of the uh, evaluate some of the uh, potential risks to the uh, to these sensitive features. So we're we're talking about impacts to springs, streams, wetlands, uh, RTE species, uh, critical habitat, sensitive ecological communities. You know all the things that Dave talked about, uh, and also the potential changes to water quality of an aquifer or a surface water body, resulting from the withdrawal. The evaluation. Uh, I mean, it could be as simple as. You know, we looked at our 90 day area of influence and there's nothing within that area. Uh, there, there's nothing there, there's no risk. Um, that's unusual because uh, typically wells are sited in areas where water is, is relatively abundant. Um, so what else can you look at to, uh, to try to assess potential risk to, the, uh, to these sensitive settings? Um, are there isolating features present? Is, are you gonna see in a gravel setting with a significant clay layer at the surface, uh, and you're pulling from a, a basal sand and gravel aquifer. Uh, that might be one line of evidence that uh, you don't expect to see a, a good uh, communication between that surface feature or a wetland and the groundwater flow system supplying the well. Uh, a supporting uh, evidence would be if the water levels, and you know, the static water level in the well is significantly lower than the ground surface at the wetland. That's again, more evidence that, that these two systems are not, not well connected. Um, the drawdown magnitude, uh, just reviewed a, a, an application, it was a sand and gravel aquifer. The, uh, there was a map wetland within the, uh, the area of influence. That map wetland course corresponded almost entirely with a mapped lacustrine deposit. And the area of influence the, the magnitude of the drawdown at the edge of that wetland uh, was only about six inches. 
in, in that case, the potential risk to that wetland area was judged to be fairly low. Uh, and of course, the other thing is seasonal uh, considerations. Um, Dave mentioned, you know, what what is this? Is it a perennial stream? Is it uh, uh, intermittent stream? And I want to caution you: just because a stream is not perennial does not mean that Im significant impacts cannot occur. Uh, it, it's kind of similar to a wetland. Uh, a wetland needs to be wet during certain periods of the year to support the habitats for the for the animals and the and the plants that are using that. Uh, the same thing can be happening in a uh, in a stream channel. And like I, I said, um, demonstrate assessing impact on where there may be some additional operational monitoring necessary. Okay, how about now? Yeah, okay. Um, real quickly, uh, you know, the HE process may not be able to fully evaluate potential risks to these uh, sensitive settings. Uh, some additional data collection uh, monitoring uh, testing may be required, uh, but the AHE process can be used to target that collection so that uh, you can zero in on, on the things that are really important. Um, and again, as Dave said, and as Mike said, and as I said earlier, start this process early. Uh, generating this, this this kind of information based on some some monitoring or evaluation of existing data is information that you may need as you're coordinating with the agencies that have uh, uh, jurisdiction over these these sensitive features. Um, it, it would be useful in that uh, in that part. So, with that, I'm going to turn it back to Dave for uh, for one slide, and uh, then we'll be ready to wrap it up and take questions. Yeah, so in conclusion for impacts to the environment, um, when you assess them and when you screen them, so this is really setting specific. So, um, it's really, really, really stressed that we are available to assist you um, with communicating with appropriate agencies to resolve or clear potential conflicts. Um, as far as the RTE species, there's an established process where you can get uh, clearance of impacts for those species. However, sometimes if it's determined that a wetland or a stream may experience impacts from your withdrawal, we're still gonna be uh, seeking coordination and responses from those partner agencies. Um, so, we really, really, really stress that as you complete this AHE process and you determine there may be a data gap with an environmental uh, resource, that you contact us and we can help you through that appropriate process, whether it be monitoring of that feature or coordinating that, that feature with a partner agency. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Mike Appleby to close us out. All right, thanks, Dave and Bill. Uh, so we're getting close to the end of this. Uh, now's a good time if you haven't already entered uh, your questions in the chat feature to go ahead and do that. Uh, we're gonna wrap this up here in just a few minutes and start to hit those and Todd will uh, introduce those questions in a, in a minute. Uh, but first I wanted to go over the next webinar very briefly. Uh, I think this is probably gonna be uh, one of the, the more useful webinars that we've had. And it's also uh, in line with some of the comments that we had had from uh, the webinar series that we did last year, where we would actually talk about some of the examples. So what we're going to do is take some of the voluntary action plans that we've developed over the last few years, uh, talk about how we have developed those plans, uh, the data review that we do that goes into them, how we identify the data gaps, and then also how we uh, provide some methods to uh, resolve those data gaps. So. That's going to be an hour and a half webinar. That's what we're planning right now. Uh, we think that we've got plenty of examples to go over for that period of time. Uh, so I would encourage you to participate in that. And I would also uh, expect that we would have the uh, 
certificate of attendance available then too, uh, which may help with uh, professional development credits. We're also considering a classroom style uh, workshop, uh, depends on how COVID proceeds. Uh, we may be able to do that in person or it could end up having to be virtual, where we'd like to take a little bit more time and provide people with uh, some real examples and have them work through it and you know, bring their projects to the table. We'll provide some examples of projects and just kind of see how that works through. Uh, so hopefully we can do that uh, in April or May. So stay tuned for that. So Dave had uh, said that the uh, certificate information would be available on this last slide. So that's there on the right hand side. Uh, so please, uh, sometime between now and 2.30, please uh, send an email as directed with that so that we can uh, record your attendance and provide you with that certificate if you're interested. Uh, one thing that hadn't been mentioned throughout this uh, webinar today was that the AG does not count for the renewal deadline. That's something that is extremely important, often gets confused, uh, and is a potential significant miss for a project that they figure if they get the AHE submitted in time for the six month renewal deadline that they have done what is necessary. But according to the regulation, it has to be the groundwater withdrawal ap application. So we've stressed many times the need to get started on this early. And part of the reason for getting started on this early is so that uh, we don't come up against that deadline and have to scramble with uh, getting a, a groundwater withdrawal application submitted. So. You know, save us all a little bit of time and heartache and, and get that stuff into us early so we can work through this, this process. And again, one of the most important things with all of this is that we want you to rely on the existing data to the extent possible. And then collect only the additional data that you need to, uh, to supplement what you already have. Um, we're intending this to be a level of effort that's commensurate with the risk for a project. So it's important to kind of keep that in mind as you work through this. And we don't want to see everybody doing a lot of extra work that's not really going to provide any benefit to anyone. Uh, so with that, uh, we're going to leave this screen up uh, so that you can continue to copy down that information for the certificate. And I'm going to hand it back over to Todd to go over any questions that we have. And I do believe that there's a couple in the chat feature. Thanks, Mike. And um, thanks to uh, Bill and Dave also for their participation in the presentations. Uh, before we get into the, the questions, I just, in case anybody has to leave early, uh, we'd like to thank all attendees for participating in the in part two of the three-part AHE process webinar series. Uh, the recording of today's webinar will be available on our website in, um, in the next several days. Uh, so you can take a look for that and, uh, and then you can, um, uh, share it or, or review it again if you wanted to refresh your memory on some of the items we talked about today. Uh, we are looking forward to sharing part three of the AHE process um, when the commission developed vo voluntary action plans and the forms for submittal. Um, that, that will be occurring on March 24th. Um, and I'd like to just emphasize that, um, you know, please don't hesitate to reach out to the commission staff for any additional questions or if you need additional information on any of this. And I, I like to reinforce that we really encourage um, pre application meetings where we can discuss these types of things and 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 specific um, specific items, including uh, taking a look at potential data gaps. Um, so those those pre application meetings are good to be held uh, early, uh, even before you really start working on the AHE process. Um, so. We'll get to some of the questions. Um, the first one here is, uh, it's not really related to the AHE, but um, it, the question is, if an organization such as yours would have been in existence, um, would the, uh, with respect to environmental impacts, would the Colorado River be in the shape it is in today? Um, and uh, so um, this is a little interesting uh, comparing, uh, uh, watersheds in the east compared to the west, but um, we think that it would be, um, you know, you know, about the same. The current policies are intended to, shore, to ensure adequate downstream flows, not only for the users but for in-stream environment, environmental needs as well. So our policies are based on the exception that droughts will occur and focus not on uh, 
on focus on not over allocating water during such those uh, low flow conditions. Um, so the, I mentioned the difference between Eastern uh, watersheds, management of Eastern watersheds and, and uh, Western watersheds. So the Eastern portion of the United States is governed by uh, Eastern water law or um, what some people refer to as regulated riparianism. And Western uh, water law is anchored in prior appropriations. So they have quite a different approach to managing the water resources in, in the Western part of the basin. So it's, it's kind of a um, complicated question, but an interesting one. <laughs> so um, move on to some of the other questions we got here. Um, how is no groundwater mining enforced so I, i'll i'll start out with an answer on on this uh, and then i'll i'll look to the others here in case they want to add anything uh, so the review initially that we do uh, includes evaluating if there are indications that groundwater mining would occur uh, during the requested uh, withdrawal and operation um, if we see indications that mining groundwater mining may occur then uh, the commission would look to limit or condition the withdrawal in a way that avoids that groundwater mining. Um, all approvals that are issued by the commission uh, for groundwater require groundwater monitoring during operations. This allows the commission uh, to um, see how the withdrawal is performing and how the aquifer is reacting and their are conditions within all approvals that will allow the commission to reopen and um, and implement additional conditions on projects if there are adverse impacts occurring that were not anticipated as a result of the review. So that's that's um, a little bit of what um, how the commission uh, looks at groundwater mining potential and can enforce it uh, that there's none occurring. Um, next question is how many permits are denied? Um, so I'll, I'll provide a, a little bit of information on maybe a little bit of what happens during the review. And then, then maybe I'll answer the question more directly at the end. Um, the commission will evaluate a project, potential project, proposed project, and, and, uh, they may identify that. Uh, there could be adverse impacts as requested. And so there's usually some uh, communication back and forth with the project uh, indicating and uh, communicating the concerns the commission has and um, potential limitations or conditions, um, you know, essentially changes to the proposed project um, that the commission may impose if they would approve it. Um, there's some back and forth. Sometimes uh, the project would just say, yeah, we can, we can definitely adjust our project to make sure we live within those limitations and the project could go forward and be approved. Um, however, not, it, it's not being approved as was originally requested. Um, other situations, the project may just say, we're not willing to, to live with that, and uh, the commission may uh, indicate that their recommendation is going to be to deny the project, recommend to the commissioners that they deny the project. In those instances, there are projects that decide they're going to withdraw the application and um, and not have a denial kind of out there on the books or open to the public. So uh, sometimes a project essentially gets withdrawn uh, when it may have been on a course to be denied. Um, so with all that said, uh, there are some projects that actually get to the point where uh, commission staff are recommending to the commissioners that um, they be denied and occasionally they do happen. Although not, not very often because of those, those uh, adjustments to projects or limitations that are put on, on projects by the commission. 
Um, the next question is, um, what about developments where each house has its own well? How is this permitted if many homes are planned? Um, so, um, the commission um, does not regulate private residential wells. Um, they don't, uh, by themselves, um, trigger the withdrawal threshold uh, that's contained within the regulations. Um, so, um, individual residential wells in a development um, are not regulated by the commission. If if a development were to develop a single well or a set of wells that in combination were like owned by say uh, a um, homeowners association or something like that and they um, own those wells and then distribute water within uh, the housing development then um, that could actually get to the point where they would trigger uh, review by the commission if they exceeded the withdrawal threshold in combination of of greater than equal to or greater than a hundred thousand gallons per day on a thirty day average. Um, the next question is um, a little bit longer one. Um, so it's how would the HE process apply to a project for testing, permitting a new source well was drilled in a confined aquifer and an aquifer test completed 24 years ago. Noting no increase in development in the vicinity of the well since no impacts during test and despite the test performed was a 48 hour test with several monitored observation wells and recovery data. And the SRBC and DEP permit was acquired 24 years ago. Could the HE even be applied to help reduce the utilities cost to permit this new source well? Um, so, um, I think the, um, I guess I'm a little unclear if they drill in a new well and there are other existing wells that had a 48 hour test. Um, but, uh, you know, the AHE process um, is, is really focused on using all available data that, that we have. And um, if there's enough available data, then, uh, there's a possibility you could avoid any additional aquifer testing. Um, so I think it there's possibly it could it could be applied in this situation and and reduce costs such as avoiding uh, additional aquifer testing. But I'll I'll let I'll let uh, Mike Appleby uh, see if he wants to add anything at this point. Yeah, uh, for the most part. The AG process is intended to be utilized for existing sources or sources where uh, testing may be less practical, such as a, a mine pool uh, setting. Uh, so, for the most part, I would say that most new wells uh, would still require to be required to go through the aqua testing plan process. Uh, and like Todd said, I'm not sure I completely understand the question and all the specifics either. So, this is probably one of those that would be best. Uh, to talk to us, uh, to give us a call to see exactly what the situation is, and we can probably provide better guidance for that. But as a general rule, I would say that we're for new sources. Uh, we're going to go through the aqua testing plan process, unless it is one of those unique settings where uh, we'd be able to use that data completely as a proxy. And, and so, that, uh, not sure if we would be able to do that or not. Great, thanks, Mike. Next question is, how are other species other than the RTEs protected by your permitting process? So the, the RTE um, evaluation and, and, and um, the review for the presence or absence of RTEs is just one step. Um, a, a lot of our standards in regulation and our policies are already focusing and establishing how the commission will um, 
review for adverse impacts and, and really kind of more on a, on a, um, a broader level, uh, such as like um, avoiding um, uh, dewatering springs or reducing flow in streams to the point where it, it will be impacting the, the aquatic communities. Um, uh, drying out or de or dewatering wetlands to the point where they cannot function in the way that they're normally functioning. So um, that's just part of the the uh, review process, and and that's um, you know assessing those potential for impacts to those other other uh, species. So I'll just pause here and see if see if I've missed kind of anything or looks like Dave's giving me the nod. Um, and um, we'll move on to the next question here. So what climate change considerations are maybe included in the future? Um, longer, worse droughts, potentially, any, any thoughts on this? So um, climate change is a topic that comes up pretty frequently. Uh, the commission is um, um, looking at climate change. Um, we're coordinating with a lot of the other agencies that are also looking at climate change. Um, one of the things um, that uh, allows the commission to continue to evaluate projects is the fact that they've implemented a 15-year renewal term. So projects will be able to be at a minimum assessed every 15 years and um, we'll be able to see how those those um, those withdrawals and aquifers are performing under those changing conditions and in each renewal there, there could be adjustments made if appropriate as a result of climate change. So one thing that I would add to that, and I think that everything that Todd said was, was very accurate, but one of the things that we have to look at as we're moving forward is how much of a period of record do we look back at? Uh, so, in some cases, we might, you know, if we have a, a long period of record for a project, you know, maybe some of what happened in the 1930s and 1940s is no longer going to be adequately used uh, or adequately predict what's going to happen in the future. So, uh, some of the things that we do is or try to look at uh, more recent data to see what's, what's happening uh, over the last 10, 15, maybe 20 years. But actually predicting what's happening forward right now is, is still a little bit difficult. And there's been... We've had some contacts with uh, other agencies and organizations that are studying this, as Todd has mentioned, um, and the actual impact of the aquifers within the Susquehanna River Basin isn't quite known yet. Uh, so I think that that's something that we're, we're looking at. You know, are more frequent droughts going to happen? Are we going to have harder, more frequent precipitation periods? Uh, and what does that do to recharge? And how does that support base flow? And those are continuing questions that we're going to have to continue to look at through the future. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, the next question is, should the pre-application meeting happen before or after the AHE? And I think I already may have addressed this, but um, we would recommend that that um, you request a pre-application before the AHE. It's good to uh, um, have those those meetings early uh, so the commission can can also look at um, our files and see if we may have information that that possibly even the project doesn't have, um, and uh, we can assist with um, with that kind of activity to, um, in just compiling the the information that's available to even start with an AHE. So um, reach out to the commission staff, um, and and we'll be happy to. Uh, schedule a pre-application meeting. So the next question is, is the one in 10 year drought recharge different from any one in 10 year groundwater recharge estimate calculated from base flow separation techniques? So I'll ask Mike if he wants to take a shot at this one. Yeah, I think what we often do is utilize uh, those base flow separation techniques as being a proxy for a groundwater recharge. So it, it's probably not exactly the same, but it's uh, one of the better tools that we have uh, to utilize that. So I, I don't think there's a whole lot of difference between 
what you're asking in the, in the question and what we're doing uh, normally. So if you've got good base flow uh, information from uh, a stream that's representative of, of the aquifer, uh, there's a good chance that that could be utilized uh, to estimate a one in 10 year recharge rate. Great, thanks Mike. Yeah, and that Mike said something in there that I, I think I'll just mention um, or build on a little bit. And he said, if, if you have a um, base flow separation from a stream that is representative of, of the area or the aquifer that, that your withdrawal is going to be from, you know, that that's really important and that you look at that carefully and make sure that it is really representative uh, of the aquifer um, that's being accessed by the well, um, you know, just, just because the the um the stream flow data was collected near the location of the well doesn't mean that it was representative of the of the uh, aquifer um you know the that drainage to that monitoring point where that data is is uh, collected for that base flow separation um you know maybe it's maybe it's um you know dominated by karst uh where maybe maybe your well location is not um Really in karst, so you just need to look at look at that kind of thing uh, when you're trying to determine if that um, base flow separation is providing you the appropriate information to evaluate that well. So, let's see, it looks like that's about all we have for questions. So. Um, Todd, I do think we have a follow up on the one question that was asked before about the 24 old year well or 24 year old well. Okay. Uh, so the, the follow up information is it was drilled, tested, and sampled, but never used. Um, so I think, you know, that old testing data probably has uh, some bearing on how you would help to design a new test. But I, I would say you'd probably be into a, a new test, especially since you don't have any. Uh, historical operational data to help uh, demonstrate what was happening there. So at first glance, I would say you're into an offer testing plan. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I missed that one. Yeah. I, I would expect that possibly DEP, if it was in Pennsylvania, they would be requiring a new test also and new sampling at a minimum. Um, in that kind of a situation, so it'd be good to coordinate with with um, both the commission and the and the state agency to to um, get some guidance on uh, the appropriate steps uh, if they wanted to pursue um, permitting and activation of that source. Great. Well, I guess. Um, that's the end of the question and answer session. Once again, I'd just like to thank everybody for participating um, in the webinar series um, offering today. Um, and we look forward to the next installment, part three of the AHE process that's going to be um, happening on March 24th. Um, and uh, once again, just uh, don't hesitate to reach out to the commission staff with any additional questions if you need or if you need additional information. So with that, we'll end the webinar. Thank you.